Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, which sadly is still wrapped in a pandemic. Uh, my old friend, Dale Willman, a colleague up in the Adirondacks, although he went to DC, I think last week, is uh, the uh, B, uh, B5, uh, whatever that variant is that's running around now, got him and he's seriously ill, even though multiple mm -hmm. vaccinated. So. Um, be careful wherever you are. And of course, there's still a couple billion people with a B who have not vaccinated at all. It's an, a human heated planet increasingly. Uh, we're seeing manifestations of that around the, the world this summer with uh, early record heat with uh, collapsing ice uh, ice falls in the, uh, in the Alps. Uh, another one in Kyrgyzstan last week that created a huge internet stir, unbelievable Im imagery. And wildfires. Uh, I'm going to touch on those things later. Uh, of course, this was a big week. Uh, yesterday, last night, uh, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, who has allowed the Democrats to have a squeaky majority these last few years, um, it broke with the party, which seems to be final a final break over the idea of a new package of climate legislation. Uh, we'll touch on that a little later, too. Uh, but we're gonna sort of today start out with a cosmic view of things. Um, I'm really happy to have Adam Frank here, University of Rochester physicist, who's been very focused on planetary dynamics, including uh, when you have a planet with a sheath of living stuff that ends up intelligent and starts to accumulate technology. He and others have done analysis showing that it's kind of an open question whether that's sustainable ever. You know, does our intelligence always lead us astray faster than we can rein it in? So I thought we'd start with the Webb Telescope uh, achievement this year, uh, this this week. After you know many years, uh, something like twenty thousand people, according to NASA, involved with the uh, the path to getting this device in orbit and having it um, uh, generate these uh, cosmic images. Um, you know, so we can do that. We can do this amazing stuff. Uh, but what do we do with that that knowledge here on Earth is another question. So, Adam, uh, great to have you on here. Um, here I am in Maine now uh, at my mother-in-law's place, not my usual setup. So excuse the uh, uh, in, in Penobscot territory here historically. And uh, you're are you in Rochester or thereabouts? I'm in Rochester, yep. Yeah. I mean, it looks so, like right now I'm on the Enterprise, but I'm actually in Rochester. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, we can be wherever we want to be to a certain extent. <laughs> um, so what was it? Just take me through your thinking, your thought and emotional process this week, uh, you know, as it relates to these images and what they do and don't say about us. Uh, well, first of all, just like, you know, about JWST, uh, I have to say I'm really stunned the whole thing worked. Like, you know, I've been through across much of my career as an astronomer. Uh, people have been talking about the J, you know, JWST. We'd have, you know, the last 20 years, people would come and give talks at the university about where JWST was at this moment, you know, at that moment. Um, and I was always like, whenever they'd show the images and show, not the images, you know, like the design specifications and the little animations, I was always like, no way. There's no way that's going to work. Because, you know, it's basically a transformer in space, right? <laughs> you know, it's the idea that you had to have the mirrors, right? You know, so the 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 optics for something like this have to be so finely aligned that, you know, we're talking like the widths of a human hair. And yet the mirror, which is the optics, had to like start off in a, you know, so it could fit in the rocket fairing. And then it was going to fold out and, and like a flower. And I was like, no way is that <laughs> ever going to work. When you look at like the, uh, the Hubble, right? The Hubble had almost no moving parts, right? Because every moving part is a, is a possible failure mode, right? Uh, JWST had like 300, 400 moving parts. And so, it had that sequence. I remember going through those weeks where they were deploying. Right. It's like one step, two step, yeah. three step, at yeah. any step, of course, as you were yeah. saying. Yeah. Any step if it failed, you know, there were there were three. I mean, there were lots even more steps than that, but there were 364, whatever, um, steps that if they failed, the whole thing was done, right? And this was, you know, we didn't, the Hubble was in orbit around the Earth, so you could send something up to fix it. This is in orbit, you know, beyond the moon. Um, and there's no way if that failed, it failed and you're done. And it's a, it's a you know, $10 billion brick uh, or not brick, but, you know, bus. Yeah. Um, so uh, my first thing was just like, wow, I am very impressed <laughs> with NASA and the engineering team for being able to get that to work. Um, and then, you know, the results, of course, right. Those pictures like, you know, uh, there's. 
what do we do about those pictures? How do you respond right. to those pictures? Um, there's a there's an aspect of it which is spiritual, right? The mm -hmm. sense of being a human being, you know, in this vast, vast universe. The universe is vast and wide, as the Buddhists say. Um, and then there's, you know, the astronomical part, the scientific part of like, you know, each one of those images contains fundamentally new information about that particular subject. So, you know, my PhD was in star for, I was in stellar death, um, mm -hmm. how stars die. So there's that one image of the, um, of the, of um, uh, the, the Southern ring nebula, which I've written right. papers on in the past. And, you know, just looking at that, I could immediately see things that I had could, wasn't able to see before, which I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, look at the filamentary structure and the wave-like structure in those outer uh, uh, edges, which was already telling us things. So, you know, there are many ways to, to many responses to those images and what it means for us. I want to actually play, let me, let me see if I can open this uh, efficiently. There was a wonderful, Alex Lockwood, who's one of the uh, scientists involved with the project. There was a moment that I highlighted on my, uh, my blog post uh, that, that really captured um, that this isn't just about the science. Right. And let me, hold on one second. I just mm -hmm. want to get your reaction to it. See if I can play it. Should be loading right now. Wow, this this near infrared image is wow. The detail. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that that sound of her voice there. That there, I don't. You know, she's also a communication person, so you could say, "Oh, well, she scripted that or something." But I don't know, right? What do you think? No, all the astronomers, like, you know, there was, I forgot who it was said uh, about that they had, it was an astronomer who said, well, I had a really ugly cry yesterday, you know. <laughs> um, just, I mean, the, the point is we all, when we look at these, you know, what's amazing about these images, right? These, This is a cosmic sculpture that is about a light year across, right? Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful on its own, right? If I just showed you this and said it was a cell, you know, you'd still have the reaction of like, wow, look at the detail. What makes that? The colors, the the variegate. I mean, even though those colors are false colors, they they are right. colors. You know, they they they're you know they're just a representation of the infrared color. So the detail and the structure and the gradations of color are still are real. Right. So the fact that it is a light year across, the fact that it is a star that is ten billion year or five billion years old and is now tearing itself apart. And that this is just one little tiny corner of the universe. For me, you know, my first book was about science and spirituality. Um, and, you know, for me, what these images do, um, they are they are what uh, the scholar, relig religious scholar, uh, Marcia Eliade called heriphanies. They are gateways to an experience of, for lack of a better word, sacredness. That the universe mm -hmm. is remarkable and strange and that we are just one small story in you know, uh, an, an infinity of stories. And, you know, for some people that's like really overwhelming or terrifying, but to me, it's just, it gives me so much comfort because it means no matter what crazy crap is happening in my lives, person, my life personally, or even the broader, you know, human historical, what's happening right now, it is still, it all happens in this much larger stage than just our narrow, you know, our narrow human confines. Wow. Well, let's, let's take this to another source of humility uh, in thinking about these images. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work. I couldn't help, <laughs> but as you said, you know, that could be a cell, right? right. And, and I've written a lot about the other mission of NASA, the mission to Earth, which right. has been endangered periodically. I wrote about when the Bush administration tried to take out that part of the mission, which is to understand and protect the home planet, because they're so focused on, uh, uh, you know, other things. Uh, and I found these images, uh, an astronaut uh, in 2017 took the picture on the, on the left of Kiev at night from the space station. And here's this, the first image they released, or, you know, a few days earlier than the big reveal of the edge of the universe, 13 billion, you know, light years away, uh, 13 billion years old stuff. And, and this, this, you know, says a lot to me with all of our technology, with all that capacity to, to create a device and a protocol that can unfold a, a miraculous uh, uh, viewing machine, time machine, we're really screwing up down here on the planet. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, and the astronaut, Scott Kelly, remember when he did his 360 days in space, whatever, he, he kept taking all these pictures of, of earth and doing a huge Instagram push. And 
I, I just, you know, this is where I start to wonder, you know, in my piece, I, I went back to something I heard at the Vatican in 2014 when one of the Pope's posse, Cardinal Maradiaga, said, uh, nowadays we seem to be a technical giant and an ethical child. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that seems pretty spot on. You know, when you think yeah. about the other things that are unfolding so faster than we have the capacity to seem to understand and respond, climate change, uh, new technologies like CRISPR, uh, the stuff we do that... Um, fosters the capacity for pandemics. So, so, and you, so you, you've also done this work on the intelligence, the sustainability of intelligence, right? Yeah. So tell it, tell me about that and why I shouldn't be skeptical. I shouldn't be pessimistic. Well, I, I don't know if you shouldn't be pessimistic. I'm not really <laughs> sure. You know, I mean like the, the, so, all right, so let's just talk about, so, so as you know, you know, you and I have talked about this many times um, and I've, you know, gained a lot from our conversations, but just about this idea about whether what we're going through with the with the Anthropocene, whether that's common or not. And by common, what I mean is, you know, I'm assuming there that there are other civilizations and that other civilizations, you know, so that's the first thing. I'm going to assume that we're not the first time in cosmic history that a that that life originated on a planet and that it evolved to the point of developing technologies that could harvest energy. So yes, mm -hmm. I am making that assumption. And I, you know, Woody Sullivan and I wrote a paper in 2016 that looked at all the data we have now and, you know, sort of did some work to sort of show that, you know, that's it's hard to argue, well, you can you can always argue against it, but it's there are reasons to believe that, you know, there have it's not unlikely there have been other uh, across cosmic space and time that there have been other civilizations that you know, other. Um, so if we are willing to go there, if we're willing to say like, yeah, this has happened before, even if it doesn't happen often, you know, all I need is like a thousand or 2000 examples across the entire universe. And I have statistics, right. Right. For, uh, uh, for civilizations. And what we were, you know, other work that we did, we were able to show that by doing models of a, a generic civil energy harvesting civilization and the plant and planets that, it's kind of hard not to trigger an Anthropocene, right? If you have a civilization on a planet that is harvesting a lot of energy, the second law of thermodynamics and the laws of, you know, sort of climate say that, you know what, you're probably going to push your climate into regimes that are going to shift the planet out of the regime that the civilization started in. And then, you know, that's going to pose problems. You probably are going to increase the death rate of, you know, there's going to be a birth rate and a death rate for the civilization. So in those models, we ran these models and they were, you know, obviously highly simplified. Um, but what we found, what was interesting, because really, the as you said, the question is, does anybody make it? Is it possible, you know, to have a long-term sustainable civilization? Because, of course, that's what we're aiming for. But we don't really know if the universe does that, right? It's possible the universe makes black holes and the universe makes comets. It doesn't make long-term sustainable civilizations. So is that possible? Our models were interesting because they said sometimes, you know, in about a third of the cases, the models showed that the, you know, the civilization began harvesting energy. The planet started to change. The, uh, the numbers, uh, the civilization rose in population. The temperature rose, but then the the planet you came to a new equilibrium. Like basically, the population, you know, stopped rising, uh, and the uh, the planet the temperature stalled out. Yay! So that was a soft landing. But in the other two thirds of the cases, either you lost huge amounts of population, you had to have a die off, where you know the population overshot the carrying capacity of the planet. The planet heated up. You you know the temp the population dropped you know, precipitously, and it's not clear a technological civilization could survive that. Or you just got complete die off. Basically, you know, the whole thing just collapsed. So the answer is from the models, from these simple models, and we've run more complicated models since then. Uh, the answer seems to be, yes, the universe could make these, but you know, you need a civilization that is paying attention, <laughs> you know, and is willing right. to make changes in order to make that soft, to have that soft landing. Right, and and you put that against the uh, the short termism that still seems to dominate. You, you know, a lot of people pointing their fingers at Joe Manchin, but I've been trying to point out these these issues transcend him. He happens to be the fulcrum right now, meaning right. a pivotal character. But it's not as if uh, even this piece of legislation, because it's it's just one party, right, is completely right. malleable. Right, right. Yeah. So, right. sorry. Go ahead. No, so we're. Oh, sorry, I'm still here. My camera does this sometimes. I see you. It's it's a main thing. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, 
I made the point when when Biden came in, you know, there was a lot of uh, everyone was like tweeting and writing about the first 100 days. And what I was reminding people is, you know, pay attention to the next 4,280 days. Yeah. Like yeah. three three administrations. Yeah. If you don't have continuity, you don't have progress that the climate system will notice. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. is a big machine. And and here, you know, so I think it's a little too hard to focus. I Well, you know, I, I tend to look at the big picture. And that doesn't mean little pictures don't matter. It just means that this is not just a Joe Manchin thing. Yeah, right, right. And, you know, the thing, I mean, you know, Joe Manchin deserves a lot of scorn for the fact that, you know, he's basically, because of the the the, the coal barons, you know, talk about dying industries, the coal barons that he is behooven to, the entire planet is going to suffer. But, you know, if we had 51 Democratic senators, we wouldn't be there. So it's like, you know, part of the exactly. problem is exactly 50 senators. So that's really where we get into trouble. Um, but yeah. I, your point is very well taken. And it speaks to the idea that, um, you know, that the kind of transition that we need to make is going to be, is probably, I still actually have faith that it's going to happen or faith, I believe it's going to happen. Because I really believe that like the generation that's coming up, right, the, the generation of kids, you know, I just, I, I think things are going to get bad. I think, you know, we've clearly missed the boat on the, uh, you know, that we, we, we could have, we could have had a very soft landing. Right. Um, right. But we missed those 30 years. And it's you know, our generation really, you know, will be looked at uh, that will be there's going to be a lot of scorn in history. history. But mm -hmm. I think the next generation of kids is going to is just not going to tolerate the kind of tomfoolery because it's going to get worse. Right. The thing is, nobody does anything until they have to. And then, right. you know, 20 years from now, it's 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 going to be a lot more obvious than it is now that the climate is changing. And I think, you know, people who are who are being affected by it are just going to they're going to just like they're just not going to put up with it anymore, you know? Right. Yeah. So, and how, do, what's gauging your students or the students you've had these recent years? Uh, there's what's, a lot of great, what, what do you think about the, the doomism thing? The, this is another one of these balances people uh, struggle I don't, with. My, the students I'm dealing with are like totally ready to solve this problem. I don't, I don't yeah. find my students being like, Oh, we're all going to die. There's nothing we can do. I find those students being like, get out of our way so we can solve right. this damn problem. Right. What are my, my students are not, are not, um, are not apathetic. They're angry. Right. And they're angry right. at us <laughs> because, right. you know, For, with because, good, with good reason. Yeah. With good. Yeah. With good, good, good reason. So that's why I mean, that's why I think like, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's last book, uh, you know, I love Kim Stanley Robinson's work. Um, and I thought that last book had some, you know, ideas in it and some ways of looking at it that were, you know, that that I think it held some truth. I, I, I was really affected by the book um, uh, Climate Leviathan, which was an interesting book by two political scientists, um, you know, sort of trying to map out like, you know, what are the alternatives, right? And their point of view was that, look, sooner or later, it's going to get bad enough that somebody's going to do something, you know, like somebody's going to take hold. And is it going to be the, you know, the world liberal order, you know, in the form? Or is it going to be, they call it the climate Mao? Is it going to be the, you know, Chinese sort of who, you know, um, <laughs> or climate X, you know? But they had, so they, you know, because they were taking from political philosophy history. And and so, you know, there was, they had various forms of leviathans of, you know, some some version of the state taking, taking dealing with it. Um, or, the, you know, but the, of course, there was also behemoth, which was just complete chaos. And I think that'll only last. So we may have that, but the idea that, like, we're, you know, we're, that, you know, it's gonna, the, 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 everything's gonna collapse. I don't see that happening. Um, it right. may, there may be places that are certainly way in, in, in really bad shape, but um, I think eventually it's gonna be dealt with, but the, you know, to some degree. But the question is, how much suffering is there gonna be and how much suffering we've baked in for, you know, for centuries, you know? Yeah, this, this, um, Delay factor is something that's really problematic. So much heat, the heat is built in the oceans. Right. Um, right. This 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 isn't the kind of thing where, if one politician gets in office, or if we sit, there, there's several layers of inertia. There's inertia in the system. Yes. There's the inertia in political and energy systems, and then, then there's just sheer demographics. You know, the world. There's no one I've met in the world who doesn't want to have a better life. And if right. energy, energy is a fundamental component of that, whether it's, uh, you know, the fertilizer for crops or whatever. And one of the other dynamics you end up with is, um, well, we need to change the whole system <laughs> or we need to work in the system. And each one has these fatal flaws because it's 
changing a system is is immensely hard and it's not, even and you're not guaranteed what's going to come out of it right if as you, you were saying it. with that climate leviathan concept yeah 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 it's do you really true. want do you really want a climate mao <laughs> yeah right exactly right i mean so that's i mean yeah it's it's you know and this is why you know as you know i use the idea of the cosmic teenager right i mean we are mm -hmm. this is our you know uh this is our test as pierre humboldt or, you know, uh, uh, said um or humbert said um that this you know this is humanity's final exam right either right. we're going to figure out how to do this because i think this is something that every every civilization you know every every civilization or many civilizations get to this point by civilizations i mean on different planets that you get to this point where you're you are extracting a large enough share of your biosphere's net primary productivity that you start pushing back on the climate. The climate change, the climate starts to change, right? right? And the climate either, you know, the, the biosphere either just moves on without you, you know, mm -hmm. just takes what you've, you know, what you've done and says, oh, okay, another round of biospheric innovation. You, however, are gone. Or, you know, you figure out how to stay in the game. Uh, and so, you know, uh, right, it's, when we look at it, it's very hard to imagine how that's going to happen because it's such a complex problem. But I think the only thing we can do is work on our individual pieces um, and with an eye towards the larger view. We need both the large scale story of the earth as a whole, as the biosphere and its long term evolution, and then the 10,000, thousand, thousand details that go into climate policy, right? Um, right. And those you have to work at both ends. Um, and then try and be kind and compassionate to everybody you meet <laughs> while you're going through or, or at least to listen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Th because there is almost always some common ground. There's something, uh, this is one of my many learnings is that if you get beyond the sort of simple framing around a question like climate emergency, I, I, my first task always is to say who's emergency. Yeah. In other words, who's actually in trouble right now? It's not right. you or me. Right. And it's right. not most of the people who tune into my webcast. It's it's people off the grid, people in floodplains in, in Durban who were hammered by those floods, people pushed to the margins by prejudice or poverty. Uh, and, and then you can start to, not only does that crystallize, okay, this, or you could say, you can make your definition that yes, it's a climate emergency, because in 100 years, the planet will be unlivable. But that's on a different time scale, you know? Right. So like right. define your term, Yeah. enter yeah. your discussion with someone listening to their ver version of the right. same term. Right. And, right. and then as opposed to just getting out on the ramparts and yelling climate emergency. Yeah. Uh, so, and that reveals a whole uh, landscape of opportunities. That's really what it, opportunities, I mean, because you really see that, that, you know, the, the sort of the doomism that's too late that, oh, my God, we miss the boat. You, you know, humanity's going extinct. Humanity's not going extinct. Like my, my whole thing for a long time, which, of course, some people get really angry for, is like the idea we have to save the earth. Right. So my thing okay. straight up is like, no, the earth's going to be just fine. The earth has dealt with a lot worse than us. Right. It made it through, you know, multiple mass extinctions, climate, you know, asteroid impacts. Um, you know, the what the earth will do will use the perturbation that we're driving to create the next round of biospheric innovation. We, however, you know, are, you know, in particular, when I say we, it's going to be this form of civilization is what may not last. Human beings aren't going to go extinct either. I mean, our numbers may be wildly reduced, yeah. which is a huge amount of suffering. Um, but human beings, I don't, it's hard for me to imagine human beings going extinct. Um, but, you know, what we're certainly going to do is if we don't do something is it's, you know, what's going to change is the, the planet's going to change, and this civil is this kind of civilization, uh, right. which has its good points and its very bad points, uh, you know, may not be able to to to, to hold together. Yeah, uh, on that last point about defining terms, the one thing I think I've seen, and being you being primarily a physical scientist, although again you've worked in the humanities, as you said, with uh, ethics and and religion, is more crosstalk among the disciplines seems so important. I want to play you, I think it's the single most valuable thing I've ever heard on my 300 shows or so. And it's by Diana Liverman, who's a social scientist. When we talk about climate risk, some people still just think, oh, it's the probability of a heat wave. But we need right. to think about risk, not as the probability of the heat wave, 
but as the probability of harm. Mm. Mm. That's nice. It really nails that. In addition to sort of population growth um, and uh, other factors, poverty is massively important in explaining right. probability. And we see a lot of parts of the world, even though we've bought you know, millions of people out of poverty, um, that there are parts of the world where aspects of poverty make people very vulnerable. So if you're a poor person, yeah, exactly. Great, great example. But, you know, the work we've done in uh, Mexico and in other regions shows that if you're poor and they privatize your water, it makes you more vulnerable. If you're an indigenous community and somebody steals your land, you're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways in which addressing basic social welfare can reduce vulnerability, whether it's in New Orleans or Mexico City. So, uh, and we're seeing. So, so that really takes me to this landscape of opportunity. And it gets to this question of how do we define what the problem is right now? Is the problem fixing climate change or fixing our relationship with climate? And those are very different questions as to me at least. And I think your work also gets at this at, at the scale of um, having us question many fundamental aspects of how we uh, behave uh, you know, in the planetary at the planetary scale. Yeah, yeah. So along those lines, sort of this idea that like, you know, about three or 400 years ago, we developed this kind of form of political economy, um, you know, which first was market-driven capitalism. And then, you know, uh, socialism was just a response. But both of those were e extractive industrial political economies that relied very heavily on science. The braiding of science in these were, you know, it's pretty hard to un untangle. Um, and the problem with both of those was that there was no knowledge that there was uh, anything called the biosphere, right? Um, and so they just went happily on chugging through, you know, they were very growth uh, centered. You had markets and, you know, you had to continue to grow your market share at all possible costs. Um, and they utterly ignored that there was this other system that, you know, that the whole thing relied on. It was almost like it was happening in that, you know, in like in the Matrix, where they, you know, before you load into the Matrix, is just that infinite white space. It's as if all of human activity was happening in that infinite white space. You could just throw your garbage off and it wouldn't matter. Um, and then it's only somewhere around the 60s, you know, with the environmental movement that we begin to have some like, oh, 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 yeah, there's the biosphere. What is that thing? And how does it right. respond? And now, and again, this goes back to this idea of like, our job is not to save the earth. Our job, that, my, my, our job is not, is our job is, in, is to keep from pissing it off because the biosphere is so much, is infinitely more powerful than we are. I mean, there's a reason why we used to worship the earth as a goddess or a god, right? Because it, because the, the earth, the biosphere or the earth literally channels cosmic power, right? right. The the solar energy that it arrived, I mean, I did this calculation sometimes. It's like the equivalent of, I forgot what I was, like 300 atomic bombs, you know, every second, you know, uh, spread across the planet. Or even the, that might even have been per square mile. I, I forgot what the number was. But it's like this ridiculous amount of energy that is flowing through the biosphere. And what we're doing is we're kicking it. We're perturbing it. And it will just, you know, if it moves on, it just moves on. And there's nothing we're going to be able to do, you know, if it really, once you get past that point of no return, the tipping point, that's it. You're done. You know, or at least, you know, you can be trying to scrabble around, try and figure out how to, you know, <laughs> how to live on the planet after that. But it's, you know, you basically kicked it out of this, out of the, the, the form that you were, um, that worked for your civilization. So, so yeah. yeah, like it's the view, it's the, it's the, it is the political economy that we developed. And like, you know, at some level, you've got to start thinking about, you know, the developing the next one and it can still be capitalism, you know, but it could be regenerative capitalism. We were, we were both at that, um, that conference before the pandemic or 2018, where was it? I forgot the, um, it was that workshop in upstate New York in the, along the river. Do you remember the one it was at the monastery, the ex monastery. I can't hear you now. I've lost your. No, I tweeted. I, I silenced myself momentarily there. Yeah, the uh, the Garrison Institute. The Garrison right. Institute, right? And there were there was a couple of people. One of the guys there was uh, from the um, 
uh, from the uh, 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 regenerative capitalism, right? That's what he was saying. Right. And then there's the right. donut right. capitalism. So, right. you know, and again, that's why I just think one way or the other, when as things get bad enough, these things are going to be, these kinds of changes are going to be forced on you because, the, you know, like people just won't tolerate, you know, the global South, I was just part of this UN project where they had a bunch of scholars write, uh, you know, write, write, do some work. Each, each of us was asked to sort of talk about alternatives to what's the way we look at climate now. And there was a scholar from, um, I believe it was Venezuela, who talked about the global South, you know, just basically saying, that's it, we're done, you know, forget it. We're not, we're, we're defaulting on our loans. We're just leaving the system because the system doesn't help us at all. And once the suffering gets bad enough, they're, you know, you're going to be forced along those lines. So, you know, I mean, that you don't want to get there, but, but at some point it gets bad enough that people just push back. Yeah, well, I want to introduce uh, Kai uh, Kornhuber, who's a uh, postdoc postdoctoral researcher at Columbia University, who oh. has been studying uh, patterns of it, what's driving some of these patterns of a sustained uh, extreme heat or heat domes. And thank you for being here today. Uh, let me see. I just want to show something. And, and and Adam, you're totally welcome to hang on for a few minutes or as long as you I will. Can. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit. That'd be great. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, in, in the news is this uh, work. You did some work in 2019 on kind of a, if you look at a planet scale, there are waves connecting extreme events in different food growing centers. So we could have this kind of uh, coincidence, coinciding of, 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 uh, of uh, productivity <laughs> problems with grain uh, right. that, that are all synced up. And that was 2019. And now you have a new study out that Bloomberg, among others, have been covering that says that um, Europe is sort of particularly now in the last 40 years seeing this pattern uh, intensifying. Yeah, right. The, the, the first study you're referring to, there we analyzed the, the jet stream, this, this band of fast flowing winds in the, in the upper troposphere, 10 kilometers up in the air, essentially which really drives our weather in the mid latitudes and is like the, yeah, the super important for uh, extremes in that way as well, in, in particular for heat waves and, and heavy precipitation events. And that study back then we showed that the 2018 European heat wave was essentially one part of a larger pattern that um, showed several extreme weather events happening in near concurrence uh, in very particular regions. And then um, we ident identify that pattern as a recurrent pattern, really a pattern that if it occurs, really reoccurring over the same uh, regions again and again. And that is an issue, of course, because the impacts then amplify. If you have two heat waves occurring at the same area, um, they tend to get uh, stronger because uh, soils are already dry, which amplifies the heat wave intensity, but also uh, the impacts can be amplified because um, ecosystems and also human uh, societies are already under stress, right? And as a, an additional aspect to this, these moderate climate zones where the jet stream uh, controls the weather are also those areas that are really densely populated and also where a lot of agriculture takes place. So the impacts uh, tend to be amplified that way um, because those patterns really affect uh, crop yields locally, but also um, in the global mean. Mm. Is it is it fair to say there's high confidence that uh, Southern Europe, I think I've heard the term Saharification of Southern Europe, that the Sahara, yeah. is that is that part of this or is that distinct? Um, that is, yeah, that is possibly more linked to other aspects, but but um, in some way, maybe sh uh, linked to, to shifts in the, the storm tracks in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So um, just a tendency for the Mediterranean to really dry up. Uh, and it's one of the yeah, most um, kind of uh, visible signals when looking at uh, precipitation changes worldwide, which tend to be a bit uncertain just because they are so much linked to um, circulation changes. Mm -hmm. uh, but over uh, the Mediterranean, um, the models seem to agree to a pretty uh, large uh, extent. And um, we already see that kind of happening in observations as well. So there's 
quite high certainty that under unmitigated emissions, I think that's important to add, uh, that in case we don't right. halt the emissions, this um, development will continue. Um, and yeah. is is the um, that 40 year trend over Europe that was in your new paper, um, is there a component that can be related to anthropogenic climate change or there are yeah. there too, many, too many moving parts? That's the critical question. So we don't address this um, directly in this study. Uh, we just propose a mechanism that is kind of physically plausible, uh, whereby um, the increasing gradients between the land masses in Eurasia, which tend to heat up faster than the polar sea, uh, that temperature gradient um, uh, leads to a stronger wind, a strong, stronger polar jet stream essentially, which, which then leads to a higher frequency of those double jet patterns that we um, identify there. Um, and if that is really linked to anthropogenic climate change or not, uh, will be part of a follow-up study. There's a lot of discussion about, um, you know, changes in the atmosphere dynamics and how much that can really be attributed to um, climate change, but um, there is increasing evidence for a couple of uh, signals, in particular in summer, that um, point towards an increase in persistence of um, weather patterns and a slowdown of the mid-latitude jet in summer. So this is something that the models seem to project. And this is also in line with our understanding of uh, what dominantly drives um, the jet stream in the mid-latitudes. So we have a planetary physicist here, Adam Frank. Uh, when you think about all the variabilities in the range of planets that can be out there, um, how, how important is atmospheric response to human activity in, in those calculations you were talking about earlier? I mean, is it always climatic or, or is there other possibilities? Of what, uh, what could... Well, I think Kai's more the atmospheric physicist than I am. I'm an astrophysicist who has, you know, <laughs> thought about, particularly I think about exoplanets. So when it comes to like the details, that is, you know, one really has to look at climate models or, um, you know, to really understand how the particular driving uh, works out, how, the, how, how in particular a planet is going to respond to um, the energy inputs um, or the chemical inputs. Because really, you know, what it is about, it's about the, 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 um, the civilization uses energy, uh, is taking free energy out of the biosphere, and then you know dumps that back in in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, usually it's chemical changes to the atmosphere, which then change the greenhouse forcing. But you know, as we've seen with the Anthropocene, it's also for it's the phosphorus. We're moving phosphorus around in a whole right. lot of ways. But the, our colonization of the land changes the albedo, the reflectivity. So. Um, you know, there's all these different ways in which human activity, it's not, in some sense, it's not just the climate. It's the whole earth systems, the whole right. coupling between the, uh, the, the technosphere, right? Which is all of our, you know, uh, all of our technology, all the fruits and, and outcomes of our technology and the biosphere and then the geospheres, right? So you've got these coupled systems that are all relying on each other or that are all, there's energy flowing in back, back and forth between them. And then, you know, that paper that you kept showing that we did for the, um, that uh, we did that, I wrote the Atlantic piece, which is the idea that, you know, the biosphere developed these very tight feedback loops with the geospheres over 4 billion years, which allowed the biosphere that if there were perturbations to the planet, the biosphere, this is the Gaia hypothesis, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, that the, the, um, the biosphere could drag the the geo the perturbation back down now whether it's not clear whether or not the full Gaian feedback really occurs but it is clear that the biosphere has a huge impact on the geospheres um so the problem is the biosphere and the geospheres have been you know some degree of regulating each other for a billion years and the technosphere is new and the technosphere that we've built is stupid <laughs> <laughs> Literally, like in, in that, we were asking whether the paper was about what we call planetary intelligence, networks of feedback right. loops that, you know, are cognitive in the sense of having some understanding of what's happening. Uh, and the technosphere is dumb because the technosphere is literally destroying the conditions for its own continuance, where the biosphere right. long ago became intelligent, as we would put it in this, you know, where we're using, I'm not even sure if we're using that metaphorically. What we mean is there's these feedback loops that have, you know, that are information rich. Uh, and so the biosphere and the geospheres 
have been coordinated for a long time, billion, literally billions of years. And the technosphere is the exact opposite. If the technosphere keeps running the way it's going now, you know, it's not going to destroy the biosphere. It's going to destroy the conditions in the biosphere for its own existence. And then in, you know, 100, 300 years, there won't be any technosphere left. So, yeah, and, and the technosphere being a, um, a, uh, an arm of the human sphere. Uh, right. uh, Kai, your, your paper in 2019 focused on food systems. Uh, and your colleague, a colleague, uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig, has mm -hmm. this whole uh, operation underway, a sort of a climate modeling improvement project for connecting the dots. So it's not so stupid. Our, our, so far, our agricultural system, although farmers are incredibly smart and incredibly right. adaptive and a recognized environmental change, the food system seems system, pretty dumb. That's what it is. It's <laughs> a global system that you got to worry about. So, so Kai, Kai you know, how, how much work are you doing to integrate the, uh, the basic modeling of atmospheric patterns over like crop zones with that wider dimension? Yeah, we, we actually have a uh, um, project uh, going on working with these uh, GTCMI models, um, these, uh, you know, big ensembles that um, use uh, climate model output to drive a set of agricultural models and then you know for the purpose of providing projections of yeah future impact on, on um, the food system from uh, extreme weather events and also from those specific atmospheric patterns and um, yeah I think it just becomes more and more important for for scientists in different uh, subspheres essentially to interact in that way to really kind of um, carve out what the future might hold for us under specific greenhouse gas emission scenarios right just to essentially join forces and expertise to to really um, come to some sort of uh, conclusion just because um, there is the need to adapt already now, um, even if we would stop emitting right now, these extremes will not go away. And it unfortunately looks more like we will uh, see a couple of years with continued emissions at least. Mm -hmm. So we will probably have to prepare for even more severe extremes. And maybe just another sad example is that uh, extreme heat wave this is um, currently happening in Europe. You might might have heard about it in case you haven't. There's um, for the first time um, a temperature above 40 degrees um, uh, forecasted for the UK, um, which is really extraordinary. So the Met Office um, published an emergency warning um, just Amazing. to prevent the worst uh, kind of outcomes. But this is just a scenario that many would have thought would be um, implausible, unimaginable. And now we see it uh, playing out um, just as the past heat wave in 2021 in the Pacific Northwest, which really broke records by such a large margin that, that, that people were, were shocked, including scientists. And um, yeah, it's uh, something that we, we have to expect to um, see more often. And for this, it's just important to understand, um, yeah, the future, what the future um, might bring us, and also to get a better idea of maybe the shortcomings of such models and in what way they might underestimate those extreme weather events. Um, cause, yeah. yeah. And there it well, is. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. And uh, the UK, like France in 2003, uh, when they had so much uh, mortality, mm -hmm. very little air conditioning, very little mm -hmm. awareness, meaning preparedness. Uh, many of the people who died were uh, elderly. Um, and it was sort of summer vacances. <laughs> no one was checking on them. Mm -hmm. uh, France since then had some uh, extremely severe heat waves with much lower mortality. So it means that even as we work to slow global warming, there's tons that could be done to yeah. reduce vulnerability. We were talking about that a little while ago. Hopefully England will have the, uh, we'll get ahead of this enough so that you don't see that level of, of, of human loss. Uh, the other thing I was gonna talk about today, uh, 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 Saffron O'Neill, who's a social scientist who studies uh, media communication. She's been punishing the media for 
when there's heat waves, we tend to run pictures of people at the beach or right. drinking or throwing a cup of water over the head and as opposed to people uh, suffering from heat stroke. <laughs> and so the media sometimes don't help to uh, get folks ahead on these issues. Uh, so that's another one of the uh, values of getting scientists from different disciplines talking to each well, other. Well, nor do they, um, you know, they often, it's, it's you know, you still don't see the media making the connections. Like when they talk about a heat wave, how many of them are saying, oh, climate change, right? They you know, yeah. some do, but so often, you know, my local, when we have a heat wave, nobody's talking about the fact that, it's, oh, this, this is unprecedented. But the local meteorologist is not saying like, hey, guys, this is, you want to know what climate change is? This is climate change. Expect more. Yep, there's yeah. a lot of work to be done all around. Uh, um, I wanted to play something just to click back to what we were talking about, about getting disciplines to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. There was this wonderful moment. I interviewed um, Cynthia Rosenzweig when she won the uh, World Food Prize. And she says something about how she works. It was really valuable. So hold on just a second. And then we'll get, there was a really good question that came in for Adam too. So hold on. Um, is it here? Cynthia, field trip. Okay, let's let's just roll the videotape. Let's see if this works. Trees, and we would ho hold our project workshops in different countries. Um, a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and we would always plan a field trip. And the modelers would be saying, no, 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 we have to start. We have to keep staying and we need to work on our computers. And I would say, no, Good. we must go out to the field because in the <laughs> end of the day, it's out in the field that this is actually all happening. That says so much. I, I, I remember a conversation I had with Marika Holland, who is a climate modeler at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. This is 15 or 20 years ago. And she was doing a lot of work on sea ice the response of sea ice to warming. And I asked her if she's been to the Arctic, has she ever been seen it? She hadn't seen it. And I said, maybe we need to have a field trip. Uh, it's all about getting observational scientists and modelers together. Uh, but here, I think even more so in terms of human impacts, uh, then you get the fluency and, and the understanding of uh, even how scientists in different fields talk to use different terms the same way. Uh, so we all need to go on some more field trips, I guess. Field trips. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I'd love that, actually. Uh, maybe just to reflect on that, I feel like there's just a, a limitation to what to, to our human imagination in, in terms of what we can really kind of, or, or rather realization, like maybe not imagination, but like to really be aware of, of something unless you experience it to some degree. And um, maybe yeah, for every atmospheric scientist, it, it should should be mandatory to see a tropical yeah. cyclone or to, you know, really try to be on the ground and experience what, what severe heat actually means. I think this, this can be a very um, important experience. I mean, unfortunately, we won't really have a choice about this. I mean, uh, yeah. New York will definitely see its, its hot days in the, in the coming weeks to months and and Europe already had its um, record breaking heat wave, the first one in June, and now we have the second one. So. Yeah. And and the other the other field trip that's worth taking is sometimes just going down the block. Um, I don't know mm. of anyone who lives anywhere where within a 20 mile radius, there isn't someone vulnerable to a climate hazard or to a, an economic hazard. Um, this was demonstrated in the, the Portland, Oregon super heat wave, heat dome, where uh, um, Christy, well, the Northwest Pacific Northwest, mm -hmm. Christy Abbey, who studies climate and health, said no one, nobody needs to die in a heat wave. Mm -hmm. If we have community awareness, if you understand uh, that you just because you're in air conditioned comfort doesn't mean everyone is, you can find vulnerability not just in Bangladesh but you know in Brooklyn, and that's. I think a key opportunity too, cohesion, uh, getting, reminding yourself that there's something everyone could do at every scale, even as Joe mentioned, misbehaves yeah. at yeah. that scale. Mm. 
Uh, well, this is a great start. I want to play one more little clip that I think is Jermaine from yeah, another. 2017, doing a story on cooking options. I think I mentioned earlier, half a billion people on the planet still cook on firewood or dung. Mm. And so among the areas where there is no we, there's no we for energy. The, the right hand picture is my sister's small apartment in New York City, which is probably in New York City is super efficient in terms of energy. Her apartment is efficient, but she has natural gas. Now it's being called fossil gas increasingly. And as I said earlier, in dealing with the uh, realities that we we're just discussing in in, um, in developing countries, often the uh, challenge is having any opportunity for energy other than firewood. There's no we for vulnerability. Again, this is vividly clear here in the United States um, in terms of who is most affected by flooding. Uh, it's, it's property for the wealthy and it's people. It's deaths for the for those who are displaced, marginalized, or poor. Uh, I had the privilege in 2016 of visiting both Singapore and Nairobi. And these, these two places, I didn't realize this till afterwards, they're both 85 miles from the equator. One is this uh, giant slum in Nairobi, the Matari slum. The other is Gardens by the Bay, which I'm sure some of you have seen. And Gardens by the Bay is like the perfect crystallization, literally, of the reality that if you're wealthy and technologically able, you can insulate yourself from the climate. If, if you've been there, there's, this was the, uh, there's one of those giant domes that is essentially the Mediterranean climate. So it's, you're 80 miles from the equator and it's 70 degrees and there's oregano bushes. <laughs> That really says so much to me. You know, we're not on one planet right now, Adam. <laughs> we're on no. completely different planets. Uh, the Anthropocenes, as you said, plural earlier, are mm. many. Yeah. And and uh, this idea, can there be a good Anthropocene? Remember, I was involved with this big debate of whether there could be a good Anthropocene. Right now, we're in a good Anthropocene and a really fucked up Anthropocene at the right. same time. Right. Right. And and that's uh, that, again, gets me back to you know, uh, all the work that needs to be done in Washington is important, vital work. Um, when a politician ha is beholden to fossil interests, those need to be crystal clear. Uh, but at the same time, we have to recognize this scale too. Uh, as the heat waves that Kai studies uh, intensify, and as the planetary intelligence, the downside of our technology plays out, as Adam has uh, so eloquently written and thought, um, there's tons we can do. And, and to me, one of the good news things here is anytime you can improve someone's personal prospect so that their life is not so much about getting through the day, which is the case with so many people who are, are poor or are in tough mm -hmm. places, then those people have more potentiality uh, to think about tomorrow and to help us all build a better future. Mm -hmm. uh, so that these are the things that, that excite me even as as we face such grand challenges, uh, the signals are there. Thank you both for being part of this today. If you, I'd love to have maybe one more thought from each of you about next steps. Um, what do the planetary astrophysics folks, what can we all do together, you know, that, that our individual disciplines and, and perches uh, uh, can't do as effectively uh, alone? Uh, who's not in the picture, not the conversation? This is one of the rare ones I have that is not, this is one of the, the rare ones I have that's all male. <laughs> So uh, this is an anomaly, everybody, um, and all white. That's an anomaly too. So let's see how we can build a better conversation going forward. So just again, maybe uh, Adam and Kai, just a last thought. Uh, you know, w with what you're thinking and working on, what's a good next step? Even a small one. Oh, actually, wait. But before you do that, there was a good question for um, Adam. Jonathan Sherwood, uh, what spectroscopic fingerprints might we detect in an exo civilization that managed to bring their own climate change under control? Under control. In other words, is what would you see out there that says, "Oh, this it is possible to like have a smart planet"? Uh, that's interesting. God, that's a really interesting, which we think a lot about. Um, Ooh, you know, there's one way, uh, you know, not to get too technical about the level of dissipation, like looking at the chemical networks. So it wouldn't just be one chemical fingerprint. It would be looking at the entire like the distribution of chemistry in an atmosphere. Um, and we'd be looking for uh, levels of, in some sense, understanding that uh, levels of, of 
what we call dissipation, th things that the uh, relationships between the, the levels of chemicals that indicated that there had been some intervention, right? That there had been some, that the, you know, this was a biosphere that had also, you know, that there were a technosphere had moderated its own activity to, you know, allow the biosphere to become more productive, but in a way that it wouldn't be necessarily productive on its own. So I think that's one way of doing it. The other way is actually, you know, if we're going to do observations over 100 years, we may see a planet's CO2 level dropping, you know, at rates that would indicate somebody's doing something to it. You know, that's a little bit harder to imagine because you just have to catch it at the right time. But I think, right. you know, a a a, techno, a a biosphere, a robust biosphere with a robust technosphere is going to look different from just a robust biosphere. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, and I guess one of the other realities is, as you said earlier, time, uh, you know, you have to make a judgment based on what isn't there, too. Um, I think you and I had a conversation, maybe it was on Twitter years ago, about whether silence, this is the Fermi thing, uh, always means doom or, or the, that something died out, as opposed to, I was thinking, can there be quiet planets? Can a planet yeah. go quiet? Right. You know, can they just like chill out? <laughs> <laughs> Right, and they don't need necessarily to be sending out beacons. But I, still, I, right. think, I think even a chilled out planet, you know, uh, if it's a robust technosphere, is still going to look different from a planet with, you know. So I, this idea that like a, a a sustainable planet, a planet with a sustainable civilization, will be invisible. I don't. I don't think that's necessarily true anymore. I used to maybe think that was true, but now, now I think it'll look different because you still have a technosphere there, and it's going to be, you know, in order for it to be vibrant, it's going to be with the biosphere. Yep. So maybe we'll get to that that question I just was asking then. So what what's something we can work on? Are you what's on your agenda or working with students that can kind of take us a, a little step toward uh, that vision that, that we could end up being one of those planets that some other intelligence is looking at and going, hey, look, someone else is getting it right. They did it. They did it. Yeah. Uh, what would that look like? What, what do we do? Yeah, Kai, maybe and then Adam. Um... Well, I mean, I think my research agenda really um, is focused now on understanding those extraordinary extremes that we have witnessed just in, in the recent years. Um, I mentioned the extreme um, heat wave in the Pacific Northwest already, but um, some might remember that uh, extreme flood event in the R region in Central um, Europe. That was also locally really breaking all-time records by large margins. And um, to understand what, what is going on there, if, if we might enter a new regime where, we, where extremes amplify by themselves in a way and um, mechanisms that might not be captured by models um, enough, that I think is a very pressing field of research just to make sure that we're not too optimistic. I mean, we're already quite pessimistic, but it seems as if extremes are um, growing in magnitude and frequency faster than we might have assumed. And, and this is something that we should really know about <laughs> before we make false assumptions. So just to get the adaptation going um, as, as fast as possible. And then, of course, yeah, it's outreach, it's education, of course. I'm, I'm teaching a course on complex climate risks right now at the climate school, yeah. um, the master's program, climate and society um, to a multidisciplinary um, group of students, which aims at highlighting how extremes can also interact in, in the impacts when happen, happening in a um, very short sequence or at the same time, like you know, those, those heat waves that are happening um, at the moment across the globe and, and possibly affect um, global food systems. So that's one step forward. But of course, we're all limited in our potential. Totally. And uh, Adam, for you, uh, what's on? Uh, I think people should understand that, you know, life is short and the biosphere is long, right? So that, you know, what we're talking about here is a transition that is going to play out over centuries, really. Um, and, you know, uh, it's not clear what's going to happen. You know, as Yogi Berra said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and human beings, human beings have gone through really crappy times in the past and, and have endured. 
and have gone through. Um, and you just have to, you know, all you could, all anybody can do is what's in front of them, right? So the idea that you have to hold the whole weight of this changing system on your shoulders and fall into despair, it's like, no, you have to do what's immediately in front of you. And that is the political work of writing the letters and the, you know, whatever, and going to your local town meeting for their climate, you know, however you want to get involved. And it's also, as you said, just checking, you know, you don't have to, if you don't want to do any of that, don't do any of that, but just be kind to people, be aware of what, be educate right. yourself and right next heat wave. What can you do? You know, uh, but just live a life that is based on, on, on kindness and, and, you know, being a, having mindful impact um, because despair doesn't help anybody. Right. And it's really it's a false response. You're not, you know, actually being full of despair isn't going to change the climate and you're going to live your life and you're going to die. And, you know, so what did you know, what was as a friend of mine said uh, about this, he said, like, well, what's your plan? Right. If you're you know, if you're just going to be about despair and, you know, giving up or, or whatever, what's your plan with that? Right. right? I mean, right. so. So, you know, we can only can do what we can do. Uh, we're part of a biospheric system that has been going on for a long time. So understand, you know, understand what's real and what's in your head. I think that's the difference. That's beautiful. You know, I'm going to end with um, the sound. Wow. The, this, wow. This near infrared image is, wow, the detail. <laughs> <laughs> I just love uh, Alex Lockwood yeah. saying that her emotions there, you know, again, this was a week when... Uh, even as we're experiencing so many extremes, uh, even as uh, Putin's war is still playing out, um, the potentiality that created a machine that could go through 300, 400 steps, 20,000 people over 20 years and $10 billion, looking back toward 13 billion years of planetary history, um, turning that same potentiality uh, toward your neighbor or you know, toward a local civilization <laughs> feels like a very good uh, beginning point. So thanks, thanks, Kai. And thanks, uh, Adam, Thank for being so part of today's show. Uh, this is sustained, sustained What from the Columbia Climate School and from Penobscot Territory in uh, rural Maine, which is now my home. Uh, get in touch with me anytime. Go to that little scrolling bar at the bottom that's been distracting you all, all through the hour. And you can find ways to get a hold of me. Share this as soon as we're done with others uh, on social media. It's been streaming all over the place and get in touch with ideas for future shows. So thank you again. Have a good weekend, everyone, wherever you are. And uh, care, stay safe and uh, stay, stay active. Hope is a verb. Remember that. <laughs> Take care. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.